Hey there, welcome to the channel. This video will be an introduction to cancer. It's best for beginners, someone who will be taking an oncology course, if you work in the oncology department, if you have an oncology rotation coming up, or you're going for a PGY2 in oncology. This video will cover exactly what cancer is, risk factors, causes, pathophysiology, diagnosis, and management. The goal on this channel is to simplify the information for you so it's easy to understand. So if you feel like I accomplished this during the video, then please show some support by hitting the like button and also subscribe for more videos like these. Thank you. By definition, cancer is a disease characterized by uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells. Keywords here are uncontrolled growth, which doesn't necessarily refer to the cell getting bigger in size, but instead an increase in the numbers just like this without anything stopping it. This occurs because the cell is abnormal or mutated. Mutated or mutation meaning there was changes in the DNA or genes that led to an abnormal cell that doesn't function as it would in normal circumstances. All cancers start with mutations in our DNA. Just like how for diabetes we think of sugar or glucose, for cancer let's think of DNA and genetics. DNA forms the building blocks to all mankind. So this guy here is actually made up of many cells and these cells are all made up of chromosomes and these chromosomes are made up of DNA and this DNA contains our genetic information, our genes. These genes contain instructions for your body to follow and build things that are needed for the body to function properly. Now cells divide in normal circumstances to form new cells. This mechanism helps get rid of any old or damaged cells. The body has proteins to help regulate this. First is the tumor suppressor gene which encodes for a tumor suppressor protein and this protein will stop cell division. It's really meant to prevent cells from dividing uncontrollably. Then you have the proto-oncogene which encodes for a protein that promotes cell division. As I had mentioned before, cell division is needed to replace damaged cells with new cells. Mutations in any of these proteins can lead to abnormal growth of cells that form a mass, aka a tumor. If a tumor suppressor protein is mutated, an abnormal cell can divide uncontrollably with nothing there to stop it. If the proto-oncogene protein becomes mutated, it will be known as an oncogene. This can cause the cells to divide uncontrollably and possibly bypass restrictions from any tumor suppressor proteins. Cancer can occur in almost any part of the body, and we divide them into two main groups, solid tumors and blood cancers. Solid tumors can also be divided into two subcategories, carcinomas and sarcomas. The term carcinoma refers to cancers that begin in tissues or major organs. Examples include breast, lung, colon, and kidney cancer. Sarcomas occur in connective tissues such as muscles and bones. Blood cancers are divided into leukemias and lymphomas. Both of these type of cancers affect your immune cells. So there will be an increase in the number of immune cells. The difference is that leukemia begins in the bone marrow while lymphomas normally begin in the lymph nodes. Now whether a solid or blood cancer, there are shared risk factors that lead to the mutations of the proteins that control cell growth and cell death. Cancer is known as the disease of the old. So the older you are, the higher your risk is. The reason is because of an accumulation of mutations over the years and cancer does not occur due to one single mutation in the cell. Next, cigarettes. That's because cigarettes have over 70 chemicals that can cause cancer. These are referred to as carcinogens. Cigarettes or tobacco smoke is a risk factor for over 18 different type of cancers. Next, being overweight. It's a risk factor we don't usually think of when we talk about cancer. This may be due to the long-term inflammation and an increase of several hormones in these patients. So unfortunately, certain mutated genes can be passed on from parent to child. This doesn't mean that if cancer runs in your family, you will for sure get it also. In fact, only about 5-10% to 10 of all cases of cancer are inherited. It's just that sometimes people in the same family get cancer because they share behaviors that raise their risk. Next, alcohol. So everyone on this planet knows that smoking increases your risk of cancer because of the awareness that has been made about this. But with alcohol, I feel like we don't usually think of cancer. Even though it's actually listed as a carcinogen by the National Toxicology Program of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And lastly, UV light and radiation exposure. So if we know the risk factors, then why don't we check everyone for cancer so we can treat it before it gets really bad? Well, we do. It's known as screening. But we do not check everyone. Based on current and historical data, researchers have been able to identify 
people who may be at an increased risk of developing certain cancers. Screening is really based on risk factors. So for example, if studies have shown that breast cancer is more common in women that are age of 40 or higher, then that's when we want to start screening them. So we will do that with a mammogram to check for abnormal growth of cells. Another example of a screening test is a colonoscopy to check the colon for abnormal growth. And also a low-dose CT scan can be used to screen for lung masses. The term low-dose in this case is referring to the amount of radiation that the patient will be exposed to, which is also another reason why we don't just screen everyone for cancer. Because although screening has its benefits, there are also some risks associated with it. The main benefit of screening for cancer is being able to detect it early. This allows us to treat it right away. Less risk of diagnosing the patient when the cancer has spread to the other parts of the body, which would then improve the overall survival as well. Some of the risk factors or cons associated with screening are false positives. When we say yes, there is a cancer, when in reality there's no cancer. This can be reduced with a test with high specificity. False negatives. When we say that there is no cancer, but there actually is. This can be reduced with a test with a high sensitivity. Screening may also lead to overdiagnosis. You see, a lot of people have benign, non-cancerous, abnormal growth of cells that will never become cancerous. But when we screen and see this, it may lead to unnecessary diagnosis followed by an intervention. And lastly, potential harm, like how some of the tests expose patients to radiation, which is also a risk factor for cancer. So screening may help find a cancer at a very early stage, especially when a patient is not experiencing any symptoms. But in the patients who do have symptoms, they will head to the hospital, and that's when the team will find the cancer. Since there are so many different types of cancers, symptoms are usually associated with the type of cancer. So lung cancer, patient will present with coffin, colon cancer, possible GI bleed. So they are specific, but cancer patients may also present with non-specific signs and symptoms. By the way, if you think I'm doing a good job explaining this topic, please use five seconds to hit the like button and subscribe. And also follow me on these social media platforms for more videos like these. Thank you. These signs and symptoms include unexplained weight loss, loss of appetite, and fatigue. And these non-specific symptoms plus the specific cancer symptoms will prompt the physician to do imaging tests to see if there's a mass. Once a mass is identified, it must be biopsied. A biopsy will allow you to take a piece of this mass and study it under a microscope by a pathologist. This study will allow them to see how these cells look and what markers they express. The type of cell is important as it helps confirm where the cancer originated from. Cancer cells usually have an irregular size and shape and a larger and darker nuclei. So this image depicts what I just discussed. You can see the cancer cells are not organized, very messy, and no borders. The molecular test provides information about any mutated genes and proteins. Depending on the cancer type, certain mutations may be present. Please remember that if this mass that was found was benign, it will look more like normal cells under the microscope and will not express certain mutations. Once the cancer is confirmed, the patient is staged. Solid tumors are generally staged from 1 to 4, with 4 also being known as metastatic. At this point, the cancer has moved from point A to a distant location, point B. We usually use the TNM staging. As the stage number increases, the value of the TNM staging also increases. So T referring to the tumor size becomes bigger, and which is the nodal involvement, there's more lymph nodes with cancer inside, and M, whether or not the cancer has metastasis. We want to catch the cancer early, not in stage 4. In early stage cancer, we have more treatment options, and also, these patients have improved survival. So management varies from stage to stage, but let's learn about the general management of these patients. Patients may receive surgery and or radiation and or medications. And I use the term medications instead of chemotherapy because a lot of patients are now on more targeted therapies. We will discuss this later. Most patients with solid tumors will receive some form of surgery, especially when the cancer is not too big in size and it hasn't spread. So anywhere from stages one to three, usually. This is when the surgeon will go in and just remove the mass. In stage four cancer, the tumor has spread to distant organs 
so it's impossible to remove all the cancer. Keep in mind that as it metastasizes from point A to point B, there may be cancer cells that fall off, which may then start growing in numbers as well. Therefore, surgery is not recommended, and the goal is palliative care. Surgery can happen before or after radiation, plus or minus medications. You will hear the term adjuvant and neoadjuvant a lot. When you hear this, it's usually referring to the medications that the patient will receive in reference to the surgery. In patients whose tumors are too big to go right into surgery, we usually give them chemo first to shrink the tumor, and then they will proceed to surgery. In this case, the chemo or medication given is known as neoadjuvant therapy. If the medications are given after surgery, it's referred to as adjuvant therapy. Surgery improves overall survival, and patients have even better outcomes when it's combined with other treatment modalities, like radiation, also known as radiotherapy. Even though long-term it may be a risk factor for cancer, it's also very effective in managing our patient in the immediate term. Radiation uses high-energy x-ray or other particles to destroy the DNA of cancer cells. It may come from a machine outside of the body, also known as an external beam radiation, or a radioactive material placed inside of the body near the cancer cells, known as internal radiotherapy. So this picture shows you the size of these radioactive seeds that are placed inside the body. Very common form of radiation in patients with prostate cancer. I hope you can see it clearly in this picture. You have the prostate gland, and then you see these uh, radioactive seeds being inserted in it. Now, since this is internal and localized, where the cancer is, there are less side effects associated with it. Lastly, let's discuss the medications. There are four main types of drugs we use to manage cancer patients. Chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy. Chemotherapy is the OG. This is the one that we've been using since early 1940s. It works on the DNA to interfere with cell division, which will lead to cell death. One of the downsides of traditional chemo is that it's non-specific, so it targets the normal cells in your body that also divide rapidly. This translates into side effects like nausea, vomiting, and hair loss. Some cancers depend on hormones to grow. Example, breast and prostate cancer. Hormonal therapy aims to block or reduce these hormones. So in breast cancer, we are blocking or reducing the amount of estrogen and progesterone. And in prostate cancer, it's testosterone. Targeted therapy is also known as precision medicine or personalized medicine. These agents target the proteins that results from the genetic mutations. These proteins are what's causing the cancer cells to divide abnormally. These agents work only if the patient has that molecular target, and not all tumors will have a target with an available drug. Now, unlike traditional chemo, it's targeted to specific proteins, so they have a more tolerable side effect profile. And finally, we have immunotherapy. This represents a new paradigm in cancer care a type of cancer treatment that helps your immune system fight the cancer. A lot of research has shown that tumors have mechanisms to hide themselves from your immune system. So it reduces or completely erases the ability of the immune system to help with fighting the cancer. Immunotherapy unblinds the immune system so it recognizes the tumor and kills it. And that will be the end of this video. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and leave your comments and feedback down below. Follow me on these social media platforms. Thank you for watching this video and take care.